I'm going to be reading Geometry 26, 18 through 19. And the Lord has declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possessions, as he promised, and that you are to keep all of his commands. He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame, and honor high above all his nations. He has made and that you will be a people holy to the Lord, your God, as he promised. Thank you. I want to invite you to be turning to Isaiah chapter 56. Got a little bit of a lengthy reading that we're going to consider this morning. There's a story of a man who was driving a great distance to go to a Hopi Indian reservation in Arizona to witness a ceremony that the tribe would do each year. The last 60 or 70 miles of that trip, he traveled on a lonely, dusty, unpaved road. Got to the village, got out of his car, went and observed the ceremony, came back to the car, and he saw he had a flat tire. So he put the little donut spare tire on, drove to the nearest community, and uh, went to the only service station in town and asked the attendant, do you repair flats? Yes, we do. How much does it cost? The attendant looked at him and said, does it really matter? (laughs) Sometimes we get into a place where we kind of feel like uh, we don't have much choice. (laughs) We can take it or leave it. And that's really something I want us to think about this morning is the matter of choice because in situations in life, we really do have choice. And one of the emphases in the the scriptures is the value that God places on choosing, on choice, whether it's about his people or about us in our relationship to him. Now, the nation of Israel was about to enter the promised land. Uh, Forty years they'd been traveling in the wilderness. Moses had led them uh, up to the time they would go into the land. And Moses recites, uh, speaks the book of Deuteronomy to the nation before they entered the promised land. Kind of Moses' farewell speech to the nation. And one of the things that Moses is doing in writing or speaking Deuteronomy to the nation is he's reminding the people who grew up in the wilderness their story, their history. He's reminding them because many of them didn't see the plagues in Egypt. Many of them weren't there at the Red Sea or maybe they were small children at the Red Sea and they needed to be reminded of their story. And that's another theme that runs throughout Scripture is memory of our story. So Moses tells them again, he repeats the law, Deuteronomy, the second law. He repeats it again to the people so that this this new generation knows who they are as they entered the land of promise. Notice what he says in chapter 7, verse 6. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. God chose them. They were chosen people. God chose them because of Abraham. God chose them because God had made covenant with Abraham in such a way that God is going to keep his promises to Israel and he's going to bring them to the place that he told Abraham he would. This chosen concept is also in chapter 14. When we get to Luke 23 with Jesus' death on the cross, remember the people uh, shouting out at him. He saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. So from the chosen nation came the chosen Messiah. The Messiah who would be given great responsibility in regard to fulfilling the prophecies and the promises of God in the very person of who Jesus is and how he died on the cross. Now here's a passage I want us to consider. Very interesting passage in Isaiah 56. Starting at verse 3. 
Let not the foreigner who has judged, uh, joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree, for thus says the Lord. To the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. Let me pause for a second. Those of you that have been to Israel and have been to the Holocaust Museum, do you remember the name of the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem? Yad Vashem. It means a monument and a name. And here God is giving a, 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 a Monument and a name better than sons and daughters to these. Let's read on. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Notice verse 6. The foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it and holds fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain. And make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel declares, I will gather yet others to him besides those already gathered. And that's a long reading, but it's a powerful one because it doesn't talk about the Jewish people doesn't talk about God's chosen people in that regard. He's talking about people like us, non-Jewish people who've chosen God. And he says that the people that choose him kind of have a special place in his heart and in his will. As they choose him, they become chosen. And there's a, a special place that God holds for us. I want to notice a couple of things this morning. First, God has a great emphasis on cho choice and choosing. Cho choosing, choice, is exemplified in leaders. You remember how Joshua was challenging the people of his day. How there was this uh, desire by some to depart from the Lord. And Joshua, who replaces Moses, challenges the people to remember God. Notice what he says. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in, G in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. A couple of professors, political professors at the University of Houston, back in 1984, did a study of the original documents of our founding fathers. They looked for the quotes of the founder, that the founders gave, and they wanted to find the sources for those quotes. You probably already know this, but the number one source of all the quotes of our founding fathers was the Bible. 34% of the quotes that they studied in this work came from the Bible. That's the number one source. And you say, well, 34% is not that great of a percentage. But the number two most quoted source was a French political philosopher, and they quoted him 8% of the time. A third was quoted 7%. He was Sir William Blackstone of England, an a, a, a English jurist, wrote the Blackstone Commentaries on Law, which were all based on Scripture. They quoted him seven times, or seven percent of the time. So you can see our founding fathers had a great emphasis on Scripture. A great emphasis as they set the country in order and in motion. They were there and they were saying the number one most important thing for us is the Scriptures of God. The place of God in the life of the nation. We criticize Thomas Jefferson 
for a number of things. Not sure of how devoted he was to God. He believed in God, we're sure of that. Thomas Jefferson did an interesting thing as President of the United States. He opened the Capitol building to, to churches. and Let them go into the Capitol building and worship. But not only that, every Sunday, Thomas Jefferson got on his horse and rode to the Capitol building and joined in the worship services of those churches, or at least one of those churches, each Sunday. It was his belief that he had to set the pace for the nation. As the chief executive officer of the country, he saw the value, the need of the Bible, the worship of God in the hearts and lives of people all over the country, and he set the pace for it. Rain or shine, snow, ice, whatever it might be, Jefferson was there worshiping inside the Capitol. Do you see a little irony there, by the way? Jefferson's the guy that wrote the, the Baptists when they questioned him about church and state, and he said there's a wall of separation between church and state, and people today jump all over that and say, see there, Jefferson said there's a wall of, church between, of separation between church and state, and the church has no business influencing the political world, and yet Jefferson opened the Capitol building and worshiped in the Capitol building with churches. They saw the value of God in America. They set the pace as the leaders of God's <clears throat> people in America. They set the pace for knowing God and for pointing people to choose God. But God, choosing God is also illustrated by the nations. Psalm 33, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his heritage. Israel, of course, was chosen for the sake of the world, but still had to choose God. Other nations could choose God too. You remember when Jonah went into Nineveh and preached repentance to the people? Remember what happened? The nation of Nineveh, or Assyria, the, the city of Nineveh, determined they would choose God. Starting with the king all the way down through the people, they chose God, at least for a little while in their history. Nebuchadnezzar chose God for a while. Cyrus was called the, uh, the, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, as he allowed the children of Israel to go back home from the captivity that Babylon brought them to, but they had to choose Choosing God as a nation begins with the individual. If we want America to be a godly nation again, it starts with me. It starts with you as the individual. It starts with the person, and it seems to be a pattern that God does in Scripture. That He'll start with the person and move to the group. When Adam is created, he starts with an individual, and then the family is born out of the creation of Adam and Eve and so on. It starts with the individual, goes to the group. You have Moses bringing the children of Israel out, and you have this nation of people, a group, a large group, as they came out of Egypt and as they headed towards the land of promise. And you can go through incident after incident. Jesus starts, and he has his 12, and then the 120, and, and so on. And Yet God always begins his influence with the person, with the individual. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Yeah, the group, but also each individual. I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. Jesus says, starts with the individual. Knocking at the door, we open the door. We let Jesus in. Starts with us, but then it moves. And as you look at the day of Pentecost and you look at other situations, the church came and the influence of the church came, begins with the individual making the choice that he's going to serve God. Secondly, choosing people become chosen people. When you and I choose to follow God, we step into the ranks of the chosen, just like Israel at Mount Sinai. In Exodus 19, God had brought the children of Israel to Sinai. And you remember the story how God told them that he had brought them to himself as on wings of eagles. And as they're there and gathered, God in essence makes a marriage proposal to the nation of Israel. But they had to choose 
whether or not they would accept that proposal. Yeah, they were the chosen nation, but they still had to make the choice, and it began with each individual. They had to make that choice to serve God. Verse 7 of, of Exodus 19, Moses came and called the elders of the people, set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. All that God has said, we will do. We accept your proposal. We will be your bride. We will be your people. We will do what you have said. And these are precious people to the Lord as they've chosen him. Let's move on. As Christians, Peter reminds us that we too are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into a marvelous light. We're chosen too. We've been chosen by God in a special way, and we choose God. We're choosing to serve and to follow Him, and God makes us into a holy nation, a royal priesthood, and a chosen race because we belong to Him. Paul reminds us that we are called by the gospel to obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That precious gospel that is preached throughout the world, this gospel is the calling. This gospel is the one that declares who God is and our response to Him. It is the gospel that declares the precious blood of Jesus and how that blood cleanses us and creates in us a special peace with God. Paul also tells us that He's chosen us and Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before Him. Isn't that interesting? That not only when we choose him, we become chosen, but he started off wanting us. And then when we choose, he brings us in. Well, choice gives us privilege. You realize that if you're following Jesus today, the great privileges you have in following him, you have eternal life. Eternal life is knowing God now and forever. You've got that. What a great gift God has given you through the gospel, through the shedding of Jesus' blood. You have eternal life and you have blessings more abundant than we can even really understand. Think about a simple thing that we do. We've had several prayers in here this morning. You've probably prayed before you came this morning. You'll pray at at your mealtime. You'll pray throughout the day. I want you to think about the privilege that that is. I want you to think about in your prayers how that you go right into the very throne room of God in the heavens. Through Jesus, you enter into that special place where God rules. And you have the privilege of pouring your heart out to God in the very presence of God. In a place we can't see with our eyes right now. Yet we also have responsibility. A lot of times, non-Jewish people will go to a Jewish person and say, you know, it must be really special to be among God's chosen people. You get so many benefits. And a Jewish person would look at that non-Jewish person and say, well, it's also got a great responsibility attached to it. It's not always just fun and games. There's great responsibility that they had as the people of God, and guess what? That same responsibility rests on us too. Jesus tells us that we are to be salt and light in our community. That we're to be an influence in the, the world in which we live. We are, in essence, the, the conscience of the community. We're here to influence people for Jesus. I read a quote the other day that said, we're in our community to either influence that community or be martyred by them. I thought that's a powerful statement. We don't just hide our head in the sands as Christians. We step up and we step out and we influence the community in which we live as salt and light. We don't pull back. We march forward. 
you hear recently that Colorado <clears throat> passed a law that they can abort newborn babies? Kind of like New York's done. How's that happen? How's it happen that a community decides these babies are useless to us? We'll abort them either inside or now outside the womb. Now they're, we're finding out they're selling their body parts, their organs to different places. How's that happen? There's obviously a hardness of heart among people who would pass such a law. There's a hardness of heart that among people who would perform such atrocities. But where was the church? Where was the church influencing the community saying, this is wrong? There was no salt, there was no light shining, but the darkness prevailed. Who's responsible? Oh, yeah, it's those, it's those blamed politicians, those, those nasty politicians that voted. Wait a minute. Who voted those politicians into office? Samuel Adams said that we are responsible to God for how we vote. You vote for a butcher to be in office, don't be surprised when he butchers babies or passes laws to butcher babies. Who's really responsible? The people. Unless the dominion ballot fixing was in. It's the people who are to influence the community. Thank God that he offers forgiveness to people who do abort babies. We're grateful for the grace of God in all of that. But you can see that churches have have abdicated their role. Churches have stopped standing up for the things of God. We've stopped being the conscience of the community. We've stopped influencing with salt and light. And we step back and we go, why is the darkness so dark? Why is it so bad? Why are so many bad things happening? It's because we didn't do what God said to do. You see, choice not only gives us privilege, it gives us responsibility. When you choose to follow God, when you choose to step up and do the will of the Father, it's not now a life of ease. I'm so tired of Christians who think that this stuff is all about their comfort and their uh, their ease. I'm going to church on Sunday. That's that. Don't don't ask anything else of me. I got dunked in the water when I was twelve. That's enough. Well, that lets you in. That gives you an opportunity. Now you've got responsibility. Throughout the years, we've had that great responsibility. In various ways, and sometimes we've come through, and sometimes we haven't. And atrocities are going on even in America because we've abdicated our role too often. The choice for God also gives us power. Last week we talked about the power outage and how how uh, uncomfortable it was. When the lights, the the electricity was off, came home, the house was cold, the sun is setting, it gets dark in my house. And you know, my house is functional without electricity. I had shelter from the wind and the ice and the moisture. I had a bed to sleep in. I could even take a hot shower because I have gas heat for my water heater. You know, that wasn't much of a fun place to be, was it? Sitting in the dark, cold, unable to do anything of of significance. But when the power came back on, it was like renewal. 
It was like exciting. And I said to myself, I'm never again going to, to uh, take this for granted. Well, it's been a week, and guess what? <laughs> I'm back to taking it for granted. <laughs> but when that power came on, my house changed. It got warm. It got light. It got uh, enjoyable again. I could read. I could watch mindless television. I could do all kinds of things that I couldn't do in the dark. Paul said to us, Philippians 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Not just the resurrection, but the power of the resurrection. What's the power of the resurrection? Spirit of God. And you know, I can walk around through this life and I can function as a person living in this world without God in my life. I can function, I can go to work, I can have a family, I can do all kinds of things, but you know what? It's an empty life without the Spirit of God. But in Christ and with the Spirit of God inside of us, there's power to live effectively for God. There's power to live in a way that brings fruit and glory and light and all those things to the name of God. And the world sees. And there's something different about those people as the power of God dwells in their hearts and in their lives. We also have potential. What can I, what can we become with the Holy Spirit living inside of us. You can be, you as a person, can be everything God wants you to be. We as a congregation can be what God wants us to be. We as a nation can be what God wants us to be. But we have to cooperate with God. We have to choose God and choose the things of God, even when it's uncomfortable, even when it's not fun. See, God is at work among the nations. Acts chapter 17, he says, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, yet he is actually not far from each one of you or one of us. He set up Israel for a purpose, to be a light to the nations and draw the nations to God. That's where Isaiah 56 kicks in. That those people from the nations choosing God find a special place with God. He set up America as a special place with a special purpose to be a beacon of freedom throughout the world. It came with following biblical principle. He set up the church for a special place among the nations to unite people in Christ, and to show the way, the truth, and the life so people could come to the Father by Jesus. What choice are you making today? Are you choosing to serve God? Are you choosing to follow God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might? Jason's going to lead us in an invitation song. If you have a need this morning to respond in any way, we invite you to come. Let's stand, let's sing together.